Hi, this is Mr. Dennehy from Danuet Senior High School. This chemistry lesson is on the bright line spectra and electrons. When you're talking about electrons, they can be considered to be in either ground state or excited state. In the ground state, that means the electrons are all located in the lowest possible energy level down near the ground or closer to the nucleus. And a normal electron configuration would be something like 2 in the first energy level, 8 in the second energy level, 18 and 32 if there are four energy levels of electrons. An important note is that all electron configurations on the periodic table are for atoms in the ground state. So if it's on the periodic table, it's a ground state electron configuration like 2, 8, etc. In the excited state, electrons may gain extra energy, and if so, they will jump up to a higher energy level. At that higher energy level, they will exist only temporarily because they're not stable. So an excited state would be something like 2, 5, 2, where two electrons from the second energy level have jumped up and been pushed out to the third energy level and this represents an excited state which is temporary eventually these two electrons will fall back down and go back to the ground state configuration of 2-7 we can observe this when we look at the bright line spectra or emission spectra the bright line spectra you may know like this rainbow color from red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet all the way to blue. So you have the red end of the spectrum and the blue end of the spectrum. This would be true for a continuous, say, white light with all, with all um, wavelengths of light being emitted. So it's continuous color grading right into the next color. In the bright line spectra, which we were interested in for this lesson, we see color bands at discrete or specific positions and these equate to different wavelengths and the wavelengths are basically caused by different amounts of energy. A similar phenomenon exists when uh, absorption occurs in those same bands uh, if it happens to absorb rather than emit energy and you get the dark line spectra. But we're concerned with the bright line spectra when light is being emitted from excited atoms. The bright line spectra or emission spectra, it's important to know how and when this occurs. So again, the excited electrons are at higher energy levels. They will eventually release the extra energy when excited and fall back down to the ground state. So if they're losing energy, they have the ability to release light in the visible light range of those color bands. And again, those wavelengths represent a certain amount of energy, which give you a specific color. This is all part of the development of the theories of the atom. And in particular, this is what allowed Niels Bohr in 1913 to propose energy levels for the electrons. Here's the first energy level, second energy level, and so on. These energy levels are not evenly spaced, however. The ground state being down here, first excited energy level would be another energy level up, increasing energy level away from the nucleus. But as you get farther away, the differences between the layers get smaller and smaller. They're not evenly spaced, but they do represent um, significant energy differences. And electrons can only hover or exist at these energy levels. They can't exist in between. So they're like stepping on steps of a ladder getting higher and higher, or falling back down between these steps. So we know there's a specific amount of energy between each of the energy levels, but they're not evenly spaced. To see the bright line spectra, we have to take a certain amount of emitted light and filter it so that it becomes an even monochromatic beam um, that, uh, I shouldn't say monochromatic, but it should be a parallel beam rather than a dispersed dispersive beam of light. So we want to get it all traveling in one straight line. We make it go through either a prism or some other diffraction grating to spread the light out. 
When the light gets spread out by passing through a prism, we see the full colors of the rainbow if they're all present. And then we observe over here, it could be either taking a picture with a photographic plate, or it could be your eye over here looking at the light, or it could be um, some other recorder of some sort of spectrometer uh, recording the light bands there. So the narrow slit allows us to f focus the light into one parallel beam of light source. The prism disperses the light or refracts it, which is called bending of the light rays so that we see the different wavelengths. We'll do this in lab with a sample of gas, in this case shown as hydrogen. So if we have hydrogen inside this tube, just like a neon light, if we use neon instead of hydrogen, the electrical charge is introduced to the light, it gets excited and emits electrons. When the excited atoms fall back down, they release light in a particular wavelength that equates to the color bands that are the specific wavelengths that are present for hydrogen with the different energy levels within hydrogen. So this becomes a signature for hydrogen, these particular color bands or bright line emission spectra that we see. So again, the emission spectra can be released from a hot gas. Uh, the situation of an absorption spectrum can occur if energies pass through, say, a, a cold gas cloud out in space. This happens and astronomers can read what the gas out in space consists of. This is also helpful for astronomy. We can tell what elements are present because every element has a particular signature. We can see what elements are present out in space without having to go there. We just look at the light coming from them. So again, Niels Bohr, 1913, came up with this method uh, for looking at it. This website would show you a little video, but I'll skip over that for now. And we've seen this already, too. So each element has a specific electron configuration. And that also, when it gets excited and falls back down between those specific energy levels, will give you an emission spectra that's unique or specific for each element. And therefore, it can be used to identify or give a fingerprint for each element. So you can uh, use this in lab, and we'll do the Bright Line Spectra Lab, and you'll see these colors and understand that you can use it to identify elements. Thanks for listening. Have a good day.